Our story opens on January 14th, 532 CE. 30,000 people lie dead in the chariot arena and streets of Constantinople, the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire. The Hagia Sophia, the main church of the city, has been burnt and the Emperor Justinian has ordered the execution of rebellious senators. Rioting and unrest all started around a chariot race between the blue team and the green team. All Byzantine citizens became fans of one team or the other. All pre-existing political parties, class division, ethnic differences, they were all reduced to the color of your sports jersey and you had only two options. There used to be four, there used to be a red team and a white team, but now there are only two. The blue team and the green team. When we human beings feel threatened, we tend to see things in absolutes. There are two sides, and only two sides, a blue team and a green team locked in a fight to the death. Who's on our team, and who wants us dead? Who's with us, and who's against us? Who will turn us in, and who will hide us in their attic? Who will speak out when they come for us, and who will remain silent? All of us now face complex ethical questions on a daily basis. For example, what happens when someone we like, a friend, a celebrity, an Instagram influencer, or even a comedy podcast host outs themselves as supporters of the green team? In the past weeks, I have heard over and over again versions of the following ethical dilemma. The conversation goes like this. <clears throat> Rabbi, my beloved comedy podcast host of these many years, I cannot listen anymore. Last week he came out as anti-Israel. Sure, he made some nuanced points about the geopolitics of the creation of the state of Israel, but he doesn't have all of the facts. Plus, he works in Hollywood, so he knows a lot of Jews and he talks about birthright, and he calls it propaganda. All of those articles in the Jewish journal that we hoped only Jews were reading, it turns out other people were reading them too. Rabbi, this person asks, do I unsubscribe from their podcast? Or, Rabbi, should I still go to that dry cleaner? Or, Rabbi, can I still eat at that falafel place? The one just around the corner from my house? When we find out someone is on the green team, we ask ourselves, do they hate me automatically because I'm Jewish? Do they hate me because they have a biased view of the war in Israel? Would they turn me in? Tomorrow morning in this space, our bar mitzvah, Mr. Kantorovsky, raise your hand. He is going to read from this bima, Lech Lecha, this week's Torah portion. In case you have not kept up to date on your Torah portion reading. I will give everyone the cliff notes of where we are so far. But afterwards at the El Neg, I will quiz every single one of you <laughs> on the content of the Torah portion. And you should all always be ready because I will quiz you. But after the story of Noah and the Ark, a little while later, after the Tower of Babel, our story picks up as Avram and Sarai, as they're called at this point in the narrative, are told to leave Mesopotamia. 
leave their father's house, the land they know, and go off into the wilderness to somewhere God will eventually show them. And on their way, they take a stop in Egypt. Because who doesn't love a good dip in the Nile? It's refreshing. While in Egypt, though, <clears throat> Sarai is incredibly beautiful. And the Pharaoh at the time, many, many, many years before the Pharaoh of the Exodus story, falls in love with Sarai because she is so beautiful. And Avram is scared that Pharaoh will kill him in order to marry Sarai. So Avram tells Pharaoh that Sarai is his Those of you who didn't know before know now. Sarah, Avram says that Sarai is his. Thank you. They call it a house of study for a reason. Eventually, Sarai, Pharaoh begins to woo Sarai, and eventually Sarai is outed as Avram's wife. And now Avram is caught in a lie. And Pharaoh begins to see Avram differently because Pharaoh realizes that Avram had put his life in danger. You see, if Pharaoh had married Sarai, God would have killed Pharaoh because Sarai was destined to be the progenitor of the Jewish people and it was important for the plot that she not marry Pharaoh. But now if you're Pharaoh, imagine you're Pharaoh for a moment. You have just found out that your close friend has been lying to you, that the woman that you've been courting, that you thought was his sister, is his wife. And now you feel deceived and confused and angry and probably a little scared. What else don't you know about this person? What is the th Pharaoh thinking at this moment? Imagine you discovered that person that you met on J-Date was married to the guy who introduced you. There's a medieval midrashic collection called Sefer HaYashar. By medieval midrashic collection, I mean rabbinic fan fiction from between the 9th and 12th century, and they fill in what Pharaoh was thinking. Here's what he was thinking, says Sefer HaYashar. Why did he tell me she was his sister? By doing that, he put me in danger. I could have been killed. Pharaoh looked back on every conversation with Avram that he had ever had, considering them in the light of this new information. Avram is on the green team. Well, actually, he's on the blue team. But all of a sudden, Pharaoh realizes that Avram is not who he thought. He is not as benign as he thought. Avram lied to Pharaoh. Can Pharaoh ever trust him again? And perhaps tonight, we relate more to Pharaoh than we relate to Avram. Some of our podcasters, some of our dry cleaners, some of our college professors, our business associates, some of our politicians are on the green team. Can we trust them? Some of our pastors, our imams, dare I say it, even our rabbis are on the green team. Can we trust them? Would they turn us in? Was there something we should have seen? Some tip, some forethought that they were on the green team? Because when they started speaking on that podcast, this person was relating to me earlier in the week, this podcast or comedian who we're using as our example, started off by saying that one side in this war is an illegitimate terrorist government. That they massacre innocent people. And this person felt sure that they were about to say Hamas was an illegitimate terrorist government. But no. Israel is an illegitimate terrorist state founded in a post-colonial oppressors of a colonial system and on and on all of the standard combo number three on the McDonald's combo meal of arguments these days. And the person says to me, Rabbi, 
have I been a fool all these years? Did I know, but I just didn't want to know? Rabbi, I feel I've uncovered this person's true nature, this podcaster. And I wonder, was I lulled into a false sense of security? Did he really believe what he was saying, or was he simply repeating biased narratives he read on social media to score points with his friends? Is he wearing the green jersey simply because green is the cool jersey to wear? Or is he essentially anti-Semitic, an irredeemable murderer who will come after us one day? And then the person asks me, should I unsubscribe from the podcast? Is the world really more dangerous than I thought? Our world has suddenly been divided into two teams and only two teams. But what if you don't want to take a side? What if you object to being placed into two categories in the first place? We return to the story of the blues and the greens in Constantinople, the chariot teams. The city of Constantinople at the time was suffering from significant political and social upheaval, enormous tax burdens, unpopular foreign wars, widening economic inequality and ethnic and religious conflict. All of these complex issues were reduced to the color of your sports jersey. The historian Procopius recounts the start of what would be known to history as the Nika riots the day before, January 13th, 532. The Emperor Justinian decides that he is going to attend the big race in person, the big day-long NASCAR-style chariot race, which is famous for charioteers losing limbs and chariots crashing and multi-chariot pile-ups the kind of place where reason prevails, the NASCAR track. And so, the Emperor Justinian comes to the Hippodrome, that's a fancy word for chariot stadium, and he takes a seat in the royal box, in the imperial box. The stands are packed with blue and green supporters. The day begins to slip towards twilight, and the air sizzles with tension. We are 23 races into a 24-race chariot tournament. And as they begin that race, fans of the blues and the greens begin to scream insults at the emperor from their seats. And meanwhile, the last chariot race of the day brings on a fever pitch of excitement. But the blues and the greens have arranged something in advance. They do not fight one another. They turn in unison and they say to the emperor what they usually scream at their charioteers when their charioteer is about to win. Nika, Nika. It's Greek related to the word Nike, the goddess of? (laughs) You stole my joke. (laughs) The goddess of tennis shoes and? Victory, triumph. They are saying to the emperor, Nika Nika, the Tsivu, not the Tsivu, we will triumph over you. Emperor, because after all, the emperor is the cause of all their troubles in the first place. He levied the taxes, he dragged the citizens into the wars, he encouraged social divisions to consolidate power, and a massive riot breaks out through the entire city of Constantinople. One of the most famous riots in all of human history for its scale and its ferocity and its complexity. Today, We feel like there are only two 
teams, a blue team and a green team. The blue team are the descendants of Abraham's younger son Isaac with their blue and white flag and their blue and white tally tote. The other team are the descendants of Abraham's older son Ishmael, the Muslims, whose official color is green. But not everyone wants to live in a world of wars and hostages. In fact, no one wants to live in a world of wars and hostages. But we feel like society is being driven into these two teams. This forces us to make these complicated ethical decisions constantly. It is exhausting. What about, okay, podcaster example. What about my, okay, I don't want to, I'm going to unsubscribe from this podcast, but what about my non-Jewish friends? Dare I ask them to unsubscribe? What if I should, should I write to the podcaster? We know how well that goes. At best, at best, they don't reply and you're angry and at worst, you get three weeks of a troll flame war on social media and then you get doxxed and people show up at your house and burn swastikas into your lawn with bleach. So, do you unsubscribe from the podcast? I would wager to say that none of us want to live in a world of blues and greens. Each of us must choose for ourselves if we unsubscribe from the Green Team podcast. If we stop patronizing the Green Team falafel stand or if we divest from the Green Team company. But as Jews, we are obligated ethically to discuss these questions with our family and friends and our rabbi. And in the end, each of us must make our own ethical choice. That is what Judaism trains us to do. And we must balance our long-term desire for peace and the pragmatism of a hostage situation where people are starving and dying. Over the next week, we will make ethical decisions like these a thousand times. Each one of them will be complex and exhausting. But know that you do not face these decisions alone. We all face these decisions together and we will support each other as we navigate the ethical dilemmas that will face us every single day for weeks and months to come. Now let me ask you, what's the end game for a war of blues and greens? What happened in Constantinople? General mayhem f fell over the city and a disaster came for everyone involved. The Emperor Justinian was not a merciful or loving emperor. And he orders his soldiers to kill rioters in the chariot arena and through the city, and they massacre a shocking 30,000 citizens of the city. The moral of this story is that dividing all of society into two factions only is incredibly dangerous. But that is where we are. We Jews, though, we do not beg for mercy from kings or emperors. We do not expect clemency from autocrats. We know the limitations of human beings too well. We Jews turn not to others, but to God. And once we have turned to God, then we turn to other human beings and we say, peace is our long-term goal. 
If the Jewish people and the Muslims and the Christians and the Hindus and the Jains and the Baha'i and the native people and the people of all faiths and none were to turn towards their source of divinity, towards God as they understand God and say, Nika, Nika, we will overcome war and oppression, then we, humankind, will know war no more. God is not like the Emperor Justinian. God is merciful. God is loving. God does not desire war. God, God tells us over and over and over and over again, desires peace. The biblical prophets tell us that one day the whole world will stand shoulder to shoulder and say in unison, the lives of our relatives and friends and children are more precious to us than the spilling of the blood of our enemies. Alas, that day has not come yet. But as Jews and as human beings, we pray that that day comes speedily. May all the hostages be returned. May the one who makes peace in the heavens bring peace for us. Break us out of a society where we believe that everything exists in only two colors. Make peace for us. Make peace for Israel. Make peace for all the world, and we say, Amen. Shabbat Shalom.